Welcome to Inner Compass. I'm Shirley Hoekstra. Many Muslim countries around the world are considering new forms of government. And of course, Americans hope that democracy will win out. But in some countries with fair elections, the results are that governments are adopting Muslim Sharia law. Today, we're going to be learning about Sharia law and whether or not it can be combined with democracy. Join us on Inner Compass. From the campus of Calvin College, this is Inner Compass, exploring how people use faith and ethics to guide them through critical issues of today. My guest today is Jim Skillen, former president of the Center for Public Justice in Washington, D.C., who is engaged in full-time writing and speaking on political thought, statecraft, and public policy. Welcome, Jim. Uh, thank you. Good to be here. You know, in America, we really value this idea of pluralism, where everybody gets to have their say. We think that it in, makes people more involved in government. Uh, that's not necessarily the case all over the world, is it? No, not at all. Uh, and even there, there are limits to pluralism. But es essentially, it's a combination of the development of limiting government to not being everything, recognizing other authority, structures, institutions, families, churches, schools. It's not uh, simply state and one other thing. And then, of course, uh, what has to do with Islam in particular, but other faiths, is uh, recognizing that the political community is not a community of faith and therefore giving some kind of equal treatment or at least tolerance for a variety of religious uh, expressions. So that's some combination of what the, the pluralism means. My understanding is that Sharia law are those laws that came through the Quran and then interpreted by Muhammad. Yes. Uh, Quran is the foundation of it, so what the Quran says is taken to be God's will and therefore you abide by it. Uh, there are additional things of what Muhammad did and said after the Quranic revelation. And that adds things because it has to do, among other things, with beginning applications. So that's the Hadith, it's kind of collected. And then after that, just like in our common law tradition, you have new cases that emerge. And okay, how do you relate that then to precedent and back to the Quranic uh, will? And the, that developed a group of scholars, as they're now called. These are the authorities in the law. They study all this stuff. They remember it from the beginning. And they're the ones that have to kind of give the counsel as to what is legal. Uh, it's judges that apply the law, and the judges are appointed by the caliph, who's the stand-in for Muhammad. Uh, that's what the word means. Okay, now, in that context, uh, then you get Islam spread around. The ideal still is of one Islamic community, one Muslim community, the uh, Ummah. Uh, but in fact, uh, that didn't exist for very long. So then you have, uh, you know, different uh, orders. Uh, then the Shia and the Sunni, for example, are fundamentally different. As those spread begins to take place, even though they would all acknowledge the same Quran and Hadith, uh, the cases begin to get interpreted differently by the different groups of scholars and judges enforced by different caliphs. So there's already some diversity, but if you bring it up, you would say in the most coherent Muslim communities, let's say a Shia dominated, which is minority, but a Shia dominated country, uh, what the laws say apply to every area of life. So you might say internal to Sharia, is family law and education law and uh, what we would think of as commerce and industry. There's a way to do things and a way not to do things. Uh, given that fact, the big difference with us is you would say uh, the freedom of families of, let's say, husband and wife and their kids in the, in the home to decide how they're going to live and what they're going to do would be different with all kinds of different families. Some would practice birth control, some wouldn't. Uh, the only thing that would be seen as public law would be that that protects the life of citizens and, among other things, doesn't allow polygamy, if that's what the law rules. But one might ask, why should that be state law? Uh, isn't that a family matter? Well, we say that's a matter of state law. If parents abuse their children, uh, defined by what the public law says is abuse, uh, which some people say, look, spanking my kids I don't consider abuse, but maybe the state law has decided that it is abuse. So there's a relationship between what's the sphere of freedom in the family 
and what's the public protection of citizens. That's how we function in the U.S. And it's the same with Islam. It's just that there's a broader reach of what's one universal law into the family. So you, if you say, for example, that uh, uh, a, a woman is basically a submissive entity in a family, in a marriage, and in she, the, under the Islamic Sharia law. Yeah, in Sharia law, and basically has no say against uh, divorce, uh, uh, be, ha having to be submitted in sexual relations, whether she wants it or not. Uh, in the tradition of Islam, that would not be considered oppression. It would not be considered uh, uh, rape, let's say, uh, because that's the freedom of what goes on in the family. And, but it's not so free for the woman. Well, define our Western standards, yeah. you see. So well, all I'm getting at is within the framework, the, the big difference is, uh, so for example, if you'd say, yeah, but what about the uh, Mormons in our country that would like to have more than one wife? Well, it's not so free for them to have to be under our system that says, no, you can't. Well, we say, oh, no, that's perfectly fine because most of us believe in monogamy. So uh, many of those things in, sh in Sharia law, we would see as more of them are public legal decisions about what can be done in the family than we would like to put up with. So within that, you can say, but even there, uh, somebody stoned for this criminal act, for this kind of uh, uh, adultery, for this, even those are applied differently in different uh, settings. So how does that idea, uh, the common state and the fact that this Sharia law would then govern that, how does that fit into a pluralism, a pluralistic society idea? Well, it, it doesn't. I mean, if you take the, the, the whole things, it's a little bit like would the canon law of the medieval Catholic Church, which right. was the highest law that kind of oversaw some subordinate laws, but had to have some highest moral authority, would that fit in the United States today? Well, not at all. There are many elements of Sharia law that have to do with family law. There's uh, uh, Islamic financing uh, that's different. Some of these things uh, can be seen as carried through in traditions, even for Muslims in this country. So the question is, how many of those elements and pieces that would function in a differentiated society can function without a total Sharia system? You take a country like Indonesia, which is 95% or something Muslim, um, they don't have Sharia law uh, imposed from the top. It's they, they, most of them don't want it. Uh, they won't vote for a Muslim political party, most of them, because they want an open society. There are some communities of Muslims that want very strict Sharia law, and in some cases they're allowed to do it. So it becomes the, the law of the land, you might say. But so for, is that sort of like by majority? So if a little community in Indonesia is more conservative and strict, they can, imp they can imp impose, for well, instance? Well, they might be allowed to. It's not a general federalist principle. Like if you have enough people in Idaho or Michigan, right, right, then you right. can do this okay. different from what they do in Maine. But. Uh, it's some, they sometimes can get away with it. Well, so it's a little turn the blind eye. Well, not necessarily. If you, if, if you start and you say that the government of uh, Indonesia, even if the president is a Muslim, uh, already agrees that Sharia law will not be the law of the land, then it's already closer to a country like ours, as is Turkey. Uh, closer to a country like ours than Saudi Arabia or Iran, where they are more coherently and systematically sh under Sharia. So in that sense, you have to say, well, how is that possible? Is there already accommodation or whatever? And that's where the, um, the question of, well, what is normative Islam, say? So this uh, professor, I mean, in, uh, at uh, Emory University, who's one of the Muslims arguing for almost a pluralist society as something that Islam can become. He argues that in the Quran there is no reference to uh, what a state ought to be. So that goes back to an era when, there, I mean, that's before the states existed. So you have a community of uh, tribal groups that live under the law of Sharia. And he's saying Muslims ought to be free to live in any kind of state and therefore accommodate themselves to a plural estate, to something else, and then be satisfied to practice other elements of their faith closer to the way we think, in private, within their own community, in their churches, 
And if they want to call marriage a sacrament, uh, if you're Catholic, you can. If the church says uh, don't practice birth control and you don't want to, you can. That's not a matter of state law. So if, they, if, if uh, enough Muslims come to believe that that is true Islam, then the idea of Sharia as an encompassing law that a few judges determine what should happen in every area of life will just kind of disappear. You might describe what you just said as secularism, sort of the secularizing of Islam, whereas um, more conservative or hardline Islamists may say, look, the minute you give up this idea of Sharia as encompassing the government, you have really abandoned your faith. In fact, that's the kind of debate that's there. If you're sliding away from uh, what we considered normative, which was what, in the 700s, in the 14th century, whatever, under this uh, group of rulers, under this caliph in the Ottoman Empire, or whatever, uh, then we're losing the very meaning of our faith. Uh, others can say, well, no, we're making room for ourselves to live with various people so our faith can be authentically chosen. Well, th this is the debate essentially. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but it's the kind of thing that emerged uh, in the West. I mean, at the time of the Reformation, it was only the Anabaptists who believed that a faith community could live without regard to government being the determiner. But the Calvinists, the Lutherans, the Catholics, none of them could imagine that you could have a society that did not have one faith established. Well, this is actually very helpful uh, to understand that faiths have a progression. And so Islam, it seems to me now, is trying to get a definition of itself either, also an identity. Can we be faithful and live underneath a non-theocratic uh, government. Does Islam have room for that kind of pluralization? Because you can't very much ask, Salman Rushdie and others say, look, Muslims are just gonna have to come and become secularists like the rest of us, like he has become. Well, you can't say to most Muslims, look, Their faith up, means something to them. Precisely, and Islam, Judaism, Christianity, on their, according to their very foundations, are ways of life. They're not just ways of worship. So if you say, well, keep your faith in private, you don't need to live like that in public. You're asking somebody to deny their faith. So the question is, is there within Islam itself, Quran, different traditions, for it to say, we can accept that all people ought to bow before Allah, I mean, submit, submission, Islam. But if people don't, we wait on God to convict them by the way we live, and therefore we can live equally in a society that's not ruled by Sharia law. If there is that potential within Islam, then it just needs to be drawn out, and then you can say, uh, back in these other traditions of a kind of theocratic imposition, we're, we're not necessarily required of Islam. But I don't myself see, from what I know of Islam, that those kind of resources are there as they were in prophetic uh, biblical religion where uh, God uh, punished Israel, but it didn't mean that he gave up on them. And the prophets were interpreting this as uh, the new heavens and new earth brings about something different than is only what's now, and Christianity with the patience of God's mercy. So that's the question. Will it be possible for Islam to pluralize? Or will that mean the end of Islam? Well, are there mm -hmm. leaders, uh, prominent leaders, who are financed with this kind of message, speaking about the pluralism of Islam? Well, quite a few, but almost all of them are in either countries like this or some European countries. A number of Muslim scholars, they're writing books now, uh, arguing in one way or another for Muslims to come to live uh, in open societies. but. Uh, most of those who are most vigorously uh, contending for Islam in Iran and elsewhere, they're not arguing for pluralism. No, no. in fact, uh, I think one of the fears about coming together and, and trying to accommodate is that the moderates will not win. The people who believe in pluralism are going to get swept up because we're naive, uh, because we are, have a misguided uh, trust in pluralism or respect or tolerance and that we are sort of giving away the store. Well, who knows what the course of history will right. be. I think the people who, who argue that uh, just around the corner comes the great wave right. uh, are basically living by fear. And the, the, the thing to, go, to do is to go in two directions. One, if you're a Christian, 
as I am, it would be to say, live the Christian faith. I mean, in the end, it could be that uh, evil triumphs as we would uh, see it, but that's not the end of the story of what God's purposes are. So if you're trusting in the God, then be faithful to God, live that, and look at the great impact it can have. Many people can see the virtues of living in that way of life. Don't live by fear. The second direction to go is to actually see what's happened with Islam. And so that's why I mentioned Turkey and Indonesia. These are the, these are the largest uh, Muslim population countries in the world, and they don't live under Sharia uh, as a total. But furthermore, look at some of the edges, uh, some of the greatest conflicts like in North Africa. I right, talk uh, about Nigeria a little bit, because that has had some real tensions around this. Well, Sub-Saharan Africa, you have a whole string across there where Islam basically comes down from the north. So the northern part of many countries are Muslim, and the southern parts uh, of them are often Christian. Christianity is growing as fast or faster than Islam in Africa. So you can't just say, well, they're just getting bowled over by Islam. Where the conflicts come is that to the extent that these are, that the, what they have in mind for their political order are mutually exclusive ideas, as we were talking about, then it's impossible to have a coherent Nigeria uh, under one single law because Sharia and a, a more open society are mutually incompatible. So the question will be, <clears throat> do you have to kind of draw a line and say, okay, you can have Sharia in your area, but don't try to foist it on others. Uh, well, then you have, you don't have a single state, really. You have a bifurcated uh, entity. If you're going to try to live together, then the question, and this will have to happen on African terms, not uh, American terms, you're going to have to ask, is there room for Muslims to accommodate to some uh, state laws or the political order that is not fully Sharia or not. Um, I think, again, one of the things about Africa compared to Europe or the United States, Australia, and uh, even Indonesia, is that uh, the very state structure which has come about since the colonial era and since the end of World War II when the colonial empires uh, disappeared, is that they are still very tribal uh, countries. That is, you can talk about Nigeria as if it's a state, but most of the people that are there don't think they live in a common state. The tribal order is the commons, and then whoever gets to be president, he, he's more in touch with his tribal communities. That feeds a, um, a kind of openness. In other words, the religion people turn to supports that kind of social order. So it's a bigger question than just the religious one. So do you think that actually the um, Muslim faith is going to look different in a variety of countries for some time to come? Well, I would think so. I mean, uh, it's entirely possible that where there's a revival of Sharia law or uh, the many of the Muslims who are saying, we can't go in that pluralist direction, that gives up Islam, and they harden the effort to uh, bring about a more complete, solid Muslim community. It could be that that grows in certain areas. It could be that that becomes ever more dominant in, who knows, Iran or someplace else. But um, uh, if you look at where most of the populations are, uh, it seems to me that how great the tensions are, that's not what's happening even in Iran. There are great conflicts going on between reforming types and the old uh, Ayatollah uh, various kinds. So because there's got to be people who are feeling oppressed. Precisely. You know, by that, by that kind of law, and you would think that the natural progression of things will actually cause some opposition at some point to the extremism that uh, gets in place. Well, we see that as progressive, uh, right. uh, and I'm just I'm trying to acknowledge that for many Muslims, that is not progressive. Uh, many of the women, for example, who are uh, students, they're going to become doctors or lawyers in Turkey, want to have more uh, Muslim expression in their lives. The habib they wear, all these hajib, the things they wear, uh, uh, the family life, they want that. So to say to them, well, no, you should progress all the way and give that up is, is f not for us to say. Right. But it is a question if they say, uh, we want a more uh, thorough Muslim way of life, and therefore we will have to uh, overcome the, uh, 
uh, non-Sharia system of Turkey's national law and Indonesia's law, well, there's going to have to be a vast movement of Muslim uh, faith conversion, of, of, of a commitment to that kind of thing, to overtake what is now existing for a long time in Indonesia and Turkey and many other, other countries. Then you have countries like Pakistan. Uh, how much of what defines Pakistan is um, uh, a, a drive for a, a more ancient form of Islam? Because there are many conservative Muslims in, as well as some radical Islamists. And how much of it is a nationalism that is anti-India or anti-the West or anti-something else? Then you have countries like Afghanistan. It, you, it's just hard to know what will happen there. Because to have a firm and... Uh, uh, impose Sharia system, you have to have a strong government. Correct. And many of these countries don't have strong governments. They don't have strong states that can, uh, Nigeria, many of these are federalists or the combined tribal areas and they don't have the uh, kind of imposition that would be necessary. But now Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury in Britain has said maybe in Britain there can be some accommodation. There's a large Muslim community in Britain from the Commonwealth countries, Pakistan and elsewhere, and many of them want to practice Sharia law. And I think what he was fishing for is something like how much of family law, Muslim banking, et cetera, can operate the way we already recognize diversities of ways of doing education and banking and so forth in Britain. Uh, but it, you can't go very far with that until you ask, well, what do those elements attach to? Right. And if the elements can't be dislodged from a total Sharia system, then the implications are that Muslims will, will have to campaign all the time they have freedom in Britain for a total British legal system change. Uh, that's hard for me to imagine, but if people are converted to Islam and they're willing to participate in that, it's possible. Well, you know, even here, um, one of the beliefs we have about America, uh, maybe it's more true or less true, is that we're a melting pot. And this idea that you have a confederate of states where people will come together and I will buy from you whether you meet my religious uh, uh, understandings or not, I don't first question that. What I want to say is, oh, do you, are you a good baker? Then I'm going to buy my cake from you. Not are you a Christian and then I'll buy my cake from you. And, and so it allows us to have the best idea of government and flourishing. If you create pockets, you know, you, you have to ask yourself, what in the long run will that do to the benefit of the whole that we value here so much? Well, there again, the, the melting pot has sometimes been overdone. It's true that if you come to the United States, both at the state and federal level, the very nature of government is uh, articulated as limited to some things. And even at the federal level, I mean, family law, so, social care law, education law, most of these are state-rooted. They're not federal um, uh, responsibilities. So if you have that kind of system, it means that if people come here for economic reasons and can buy a farm and sell their eggs to whomever, then you have what you call an open market. If you have educational pluralism, it means people can educate their children in different schools. But one of the strongest movements throughout the 19th century was anti-Catholicism on the part of Protestants. We were deathly afraid that more Catholics immigrating in the country with yielding to the papal authority is the end of America. This is what the people objected to John F. Kennedy. Precisely. They said who he's going to be loyal to. But that one was very strong and with some violence in the 19th century. And that's when basically the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants in New York and Boston and set up the kind of system that we had now, which was to say all public monies should go only to non-sectarian schools. What they meant by non-sectarian in the 19th century was not Catholic. Right. They were very religious, these public schools. They were Protestant. But uh, we have, in other words, at that point you had to ask, what is part of the national identity? And in the 19th century you were saying it has to be Protestant moral culture, not the Protestant church. Catholics are free to have their churches and their schools, but they'd have to pay for their schools. Right. So how do you marginalize what you don't see as authentically part of the country? 
Uh, today, if you look, we're far more pluralistic. Uh, we have far more Hispanic uh, people in uh, many enclaves in, in uh, the West Coast in particular, but elsewhere you have very strong Asian communities, which are almost self-contained, except in market. And uh, you, if you were an Anglo going in, you could buy from the shops and eat in the restaurants, but you wouldn't be able to communicate with anybody if you're not speaking Chinese or something else, you wouldn't be participating in uh, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So the pluralism uh, functions as long as people are tolerant and if they're not demanding that everybody has to submit to one thing. So I think uh, the question of the future will be how many countries uh, with Islam as the dominant religion will become pluralistic in themselves. Well, this is going to take both for the West and for the uh, Islamic countries deep commitment to wanting their people to flourish and to live without fear. And I think what you're seeing now in many of the, uh, the revolutions in the Mediterranean and uh, Middle East uh, which are not at all motivated by radical Islam, and that way I think it's, it's bringing a whole new thing to pass, is because these people have begun to get education. They're university graduates, many of the young people, they want jobs. Right. And so what they're fed up with is a stale society, a frozen society, one that hasn't changed. So in that sense, if what comes to be the desire is a wider degree of flourishing, meaning jobs, etc. Uh, they're going to have to change the societies in a pretty radical way. Thank you. My guest today has been Jim Skillen, former president of the Center for Public Justice in Washington, D.C., who is engaged in full-time writing and speaking on political thought, statecraft, and public policy. He contributed to the book Sharia and the West. I'm Shirley Hoekstra, and thank you for watching Inner Compass.